Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed, alleluia. Happy Easter. We know that Easter is not just one day, it's a whole season, isn't it? So shall we try that again? Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed, alleluia. <laughs> Wonderful to see you all here in the building. We're not taking any reservations anymore. So feel free to just waltz right in with your mask. And uh, I know we have lots of people on Zoom as well as we did on Facebook for our first service. So just in case there's anybody who doesn't know me, I'm Reverend Marty Swords Harrell. I'm having a rather light day today because it's Youth Sunday. The confirmation class uh, was asked to put together uh, one service. This is not Confirmation Sunday. That will be on Pentecost, which is May 23rd. But our three young men, Gavin and Gabe and Wyndham, all had parts in this service, as did their mentors, Kelly and Rachel and Jennifer. So you're going to hear all of our... We won't be seeing them, though, because we are putting the service out on YouTube now. And we'd rather not put out videos or pictures of youth. So anybody under 18, you're just going to hear their voice, but you're not going to see their face. But maybe by, by the time we have the actual confirmation, we'll figure out whether we want to change that or not. In any case, um, we'll be having you put the joys and concerns on your prayer card or in the Zoom chat, and somebody will send them to me. And um, we are a reconciling congregation, which means that we are open to all. We're working hard within our denomination of United Methodist Church to become more and more inclusive. And I'm hoping that you saw <clears throat> the picture in the paper yesterday. In the, it was in the back page of the sports section, I think. Great moments in sports. Um, this was over a month ago when we had a picture taken of our new um, Love Each Other Black Lives Matter banner out here on the Chestnut Street side. And uh, Reverend Lana, LaDonna Clark was there from uh, Church in the Hood. She's the one who designed our banner and a whole bunch of people were there from the congregation and from her congregation. And I wrote an article about it and sent the picture and the article to the friends and neighbors section of the paper, and then I never heard anything more, and then it appeared yesterday. So, <laughs> so I'm glad because we need to continue to remind the neighborhood and to each other that uh, our work um, on anti-racism is very much an integral part of our reconciling mission. And it's a lot more than just a banner and a class. It's uh, continuing to work on opening our hearts and our minds and our doors to a great diversity. I heard a new term yesterday, neurodiversity. That's folks maybe on the autism spectrum. So there's all kinds of diversity and God has made a beautiful tapestry of um, difference that we celebrate here. So you are welcome, whether you are gay or straight, black, white, brown, Asian, whether you're any background or nationality, socioeconomic category, age, neurodiversity, um, transgender, uh, you name it. We are opening our minds and our doors and our hearts to all. So we'll begin our worship this morning. Our theme is helping others. That was the theme that our youth chose. They also chose the scriptures and um, you'll hear their voices as I said. But we'll begin with a little time of silent prayer just to breathe in and take in the beauty of God's spirit and the creative energy that comes from God. So let's just take a few moments to breathe deeply and uh, put ourselves in a frame of worship.
bless you. Please join in the call to worship in the bold type um, where we're listening and responding. Um, the words will be on the screen. Show us, good Lord, how to be frugal. Till all are fed. How to weep. Till all can laugh. How to be meek. Till all can stand in pride. How to mourn. Till all are comforted. How to be restless. Till all live in peace. How to claim less. Till all find justice. Amen. Amen. Rachel Risberger and her sister Penny was on the alto there. The peace of Christ be with all of us across Zoom and here in the sanctuary. Please turn around and do a non-contact peace with whomever. Peace be with you. Wonderful. And we'll, um, for our children's time, uh, two of our guys, Gabe and Wyndham, did, uh, and also Preston, are, you'll hear their voices, and Gabe did an animation updating the parable of the Good Samaritan. So please enjoy, and then it'll go straight into our children's hymn this morning, which is in Spanish, and it's called Alabare, which means I will praise, I will praise the Lord, and that's sung by uh, Jennifer Whittington. Once on Sesame Street, Elmo was lying on the side of the road after he was robbed. He cried out for help. Help! Elmo needs a doctor! But no one came. Then Bert was walking by. Elmo, recognizing him, cried out. Help me, please! Oh, he's an Bert saw him but walked right by him, not wanting to do anything that could get messy. After that, Cookie Monster walked by. Elmo again recognized his friend and called out. Elmo needs to go to the hospital. Cookie Monster was too busy eating cookies to notice Elmo. 
Finally, a Teletubby was walking down the street to get back to his show. Elmo, with his last ounce of breath, called out. Teletubby stopped and looked at Elmo. Some words appeared on the Teletubby's stomach. Are you okay? Elmo tried to respond, but was too weak. The Teletubby then picked Elmo up and brought him to a local oh Elmo by Grover. More words appeared on the Teletubby's stomach. They said, he needs rest. Here's $50. I think it should be enough. Take care of him. Feed him. I will pay more if it is not enough. Then, then the Teletubby left. Afterwards, when Elmo woke up, Grover told him about what had happened. This reading is from Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37 from the New Revised Standard Bible. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer, do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. When he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him, the next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him. And when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise.
This reading is from Luke chapter 13, verses 10 through 17, from the New Revised Standard Bible. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites! Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for eighteen long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things that he was doing. Great readers are youth, aren't they? Thank you, Wyndham. I'm so proud of our three confirmands, Gavin and Gabe and Wyndham, and looking forward to their confirmation on Pentecost, May 23rd. You'll hear more about it as it gets a little closer. And thank you to Kelly and uh, to Gavin for choosing the call to worship from some resources that I lent you. It talked, as you remember, in a kind of poetic way about making choices, right? Choosing to be frugal till all are fed. Life is full of choices, isn't it? Choosing to be meek till all can stand in pride. That's choosing to live in solidarity with people who for whatever reasons may be hiding in the shadows. We hear more and more about how our trans youth, for instance, don't feel they can really show themselves. And there's other terrible discriminations that really uh, beaten down people's lives uh, because of their race or their language. Uh, it also talked about choosing a restlessness with the world as it is today. So what happens to a child when they become a youth? Today is Youth Sunday. One thing that happens gradually that we can watch happen if we have children in our life. Um, in every more or less happy and normal family, as a child becomes a youth, as they grow and mature, as they can handle it, young people are given more and more freedom to make choices about their daily lives. I remember very well the day I was in seventh grade and I was 12, the day my mom said, yeah, you can go ahead and get on the ferry and go to Manhattan Mall by yourself. Whoa, <laughs> we were living in Staten Island at the time. That was very cool, it cost a nickel. And my mother told us a story when she was only six and they were living in Mount Vernon, Iowa. Every week, she would walk across campus all by herself for her violin lesson. And the, the president's wife taught her violin and she wasn't allowed to carry the instrument home for a whole year until she had the uh, position exactly right. But, you know, I think different kids are different as far as what we can trust them to do. And as they grow, they're given more freedom to make choices, right? And that's such a joy. The very little, little kids don't have a lot of choices because they can't handle them yet. But as a child grows up to be a youth, they are granted more and more freedom. Amen. We're talking about freedom today. Talking about freedom that comes up twice in the gospel that we just heard Wyndham read so well. What does Jesus say to this terribly bent over woman, so ill, so crippled? She couldn't stand up straight, couldn't see what was straight in front of her. She lived in the shadows, staring at the floor. Notice the language. When Jesus saw her, he called out to her, Woman, you are free from your bondage, from your sickness, you are free. And then a few minutes later, when he gets into a discussion about the healing with an official from the religious community, Jesus again talks about freedom. 
Any one of you, he says to those gathered around for worship, any one of you would untie your ox or your donkey from the stall and take it out to give it water on, even if it was the Sabbath, wouldn't you? Now here is this descendant of Abraham kept in bondage for 18 long years. Shouldn't, be, shouldn't she be set free on the Sabbath day? Jesus is all about freedom. Jesus means freedom. Freedom from whatever ties us up, enslaves us, keeps us from being all that God intends us to be. A few years ago, I was blessed to be sent by the annual conference to a four-day meeting in Nashville, Tennessee, where some of our national offices are, along with about 100 other United Methodist clergy and laity from across the connection. The heart of it for me, what I remembered so well and carried with me was a talk given by one of our bishops. I think he was from Chicago. Now, unless you're very new to United Methodism, or maybe if you've been living under a rock for almost 50 years, you know there are tensions in our denomination, as putting it mildly, as there have been in others, over some what call controversial issues, issues in gender equality, abortion, gay rights, but also the authority of scripture, economic justice, racism, gun, gun rights, environmental crisis. Many of us who are leaders in the church have been struggling for years to try to understand the underlying issues in these controversies. Having controversies in the church, by the way, is nothing new, is it? Even in Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth, which is one of the oldest documents in the New Testament, the great apostle observes, I have heard that there are quarrels among you. Well, this bishop in Mountain Nashville gave us a very helpful way to understand our present divide. He noted that for some in the church, the point of the Christian life may be summed up in one word, holiness. For this group to be Christian is to be holy, following God's decree in the book of Leviticus, you must be holy as I am holy. So the point of Christianity for these folks is to show forth God's holiness in their daily life, living according to God's commandments, living in what they interpret to be God's way. For these Christians, the main problem in the world is what they see as the decadence, the immorality of modern culture. That's how they see it. The main point of Christianity for them is to live as a witness against what they see as this decadence, this moral decay, as they call it, by living the holy life. Those who understand the faith this way see themselves as strong followers, both of Jesus and of John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement. Then there are others of us, and especially us who are counting ourselves since 1989, almost 33 years in the Reconciling Ministries Network, for whom the Christian faith can be summed up not by the word holiness, but by the word hospitality. For us, the main problem is that both in society and within the church itself, too many people are being shut out, judged, excluded, belittled, and outright oppressed because of things that shouldn't matter. Their gender, their race, nationality, language, socioeconomic class, immigration status, education level, sexual orientation, gender identity, age. The main point of Christianity for those of us in the reconciling movement and others who maybe haven't actually joined the movement yet, but are certainly sympathetic and empathetic to our cause, the main point is to grow a community that draws the circle as wide as possible to throw the doors open, to open our hearts, open our minds, let everyone feel and experience the wide, wide inclusive love of God. And those of us who understand the faith this way see ourselves as strong followers of Jesus and of John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement. Well, the story that we read from the gospel, well, both of the stories from the gospel of Luke today present Jesus strongly on the side of the hospitality folks. He's throwing the doors open wide, the door of his own tradition, 
his own faith community. As the second story says, to someone who up to that moment had been invisible. He extended his hand to a woman, an unclean, bent over woman, and set her free. Straightened her up in, completely, in complete disregard for the holiness of the Sabbath rules that the leadership of his faith community was so concerned about. Jesus means freedom. Freedom from a religion of rules, for, from a faith centered on upright behavior. Let no, yet no one reading the Gospel of Luke in its entirety, which our confirmands are doing right now with their mentors, right, Kelly, would ever say, no one would ever say that Jesus was not devout reading this particular gospel. No one would say that he was not holy. The Gospel of Luke is full of instances where Jesus is praying, probably more than in any other gospel where he takes time apart for communing with God. He's in the temple regularly. He gives his very first sermon in the temple there, in the synagogue, I should say, in Nazareth. And just about every other story about him is told in order to show how his life and his ministry fulfill the prophecy of his people's holy book, what we now call the Old Testament. Jesus' ethics fulfilled the laws of holiness fulfilled them, not abrogated them. After all, even the demons recognize him as the Holy One of God. The fact is that if Jesus had been just one more pious Jew in the first century, history would have forgotten him. What showed his majesty, his messiahship, his kingliness was that he was willing, no, not just willing, he was compelled to take a stand for those who had no standing, to speak for the voiceless, to offer the healing and life-giving love of God to those that the religious community had long shut out. Because it's always the right time to do the right thing, amen. After all, in this story today, the woman had been bent over for 18 long years and each day of those 18 years, including many, many Sabbaths, the pious men around her had been feeding and watering their animals, never seeing the plight of this poor afflicted woman right under their noses. When faith becomes high bound in holiness, holiness, I have to do air quotes there, it can be cold and rigid and blind, unfeeling, unable to flex, unresponsive to God's initiative to the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. The German theologian Ernst Kaysemann tells a story he heard in Amsterdam after the severe floods and storms which Holland suffered in 1952. The scene was one of those parishes where people felt themselves strictly bound to obey God's commandments and therefore always to keep the Sabbath holy. And man, when they uh, kept that Sabbath holy, those Dutch Calvinists, they'd be in church all day long on Sunday, right? Anybody here know that, that uh, tradition? I know Marty, Marty Becker will say, will testify. Should he call out the people? Oh wait, um, so what happened was the whole village was being threatened by wind and waves. The water was right up to the top of the dike. The dike hadn't to be strengthened. It was Sunday, but the dike, they needed every able-bodied person to come out of their homes and come to the dike and add some layers to it and strengthen it from the inside if the whole village were to be spared. So the police notified the pastor who now found himself in a religious dilemma. Should he call out the people of the parish that had been entrusted to him and set them to do the work that was necessary to strengthen the dike and save the, save the whole town, even if it meant profaning the Sabbath? He found the burden of making this personal decision too much for him, so he summoned the church council to consult and decide. Discussion went on, as one might suppose, with the elders of the church making their argument as follows. We live to carry out God's will. 
God, being omnipotent, can always perform a miracle with the wind and the waves. Our duty is obedience in life or in death. The pastor tried one last argument, perhaps kind of against his own convictions. Did not Jesus himself, he said, on occasion, break the fourth commandment and declare that the Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath? Thereupon, a venerable old man stood up. I have always been troubled, pastor he said, by something I have not yet ventured to say publicly, now I must say it. I have always had the feeling that our Lord Jesus was just a bit of a liberal. Jesus means freedom, freedom that shakes up our assumptions, that blows to smithereens the schemas by which we understand the world. Truth be told, we are also troubled sometimes, as this man was troubled by the wideness of God's mercy, by the unique way in which our Lord was able in every moment to combine holiness with hospitality without losing either one, to redefine holiness by extending hospitality, by helping, by being kind because people came first for him, amen? That was the bottom line. The needs of people came first, especially the needs of the neediest, because that's what some people found so offensive, the Pharisees of his day and of ours, because it's always the right time to do the right thing, amen? Jesus means freedom. Still in our day, in this very hour, he offers liberation from all that would bind us, from the addictions that rule our lives, the destructive habits that reside in some of our relationships, the rules that hold oppression in place in church and society. Jesus puts people first. And he believed so much in the holiness of that hospitality that he was willing to die for it and for us. So rise up, people. Lengthen that spine and raise up your head and strengthen your feeble knees. There is hope. There is new life. There is forgiveness. There is resurrection. There is healing. There is liberation from all that holds us so tied down. Give all of our oppressions to Jesus and he will set us free.
Wonderful. Thank you, Jennifer. And uh, I think that was Wyndham also in the background there. Beautiful. So our jingle for extra change in the uh, offering plate this month goes to the OHS after prom party. And uh, I know that's always something very great occasion for our high school kids and parents. So let's uh, lift up these prayers for the ways in which people have found to uh, support the ministries of this congregation, the ministries and the mission by sending checks in the mail, by bringing their offerings here to the sanctuary, by using our new Tithely app, and also by our PayPal account on the website. Loving God, we thank you for the privilege of participating in your mission and your ministries to help others through these gifts, both here locally and around the world. Speed them on their way to help human need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So our prayers from the first service, <clears throat> Rich is asking continuing to ask for prayers for Fran and Jesse, and Beverly asks for prayers for her friend, Gloria. And for this service, for anybody have one here? I don't know if there's any prayer, prayer cards anybody has there. Lee Luo is waiting the results of MRI tests and her second vaccine and prayers for teaching duties. And for all those who are still awaiting their vaccines and who are suffering from COVID, I know that um, Marty Becker's neighbor is very, very ill from COVID. Um, and we want to lift up Officer Ralph Pajerski and the Tyler Johnson family after the terrible incident last week, this past week, and um, everyone else on the prayer list. So each each prayer will end uh, in your mercy, and please respond to hear our prayer. Let's be together in prayer. What a wondrous time is spring. We thank you, God, for the renewal of the earth, for the Easter good news in each budding out tree, in each daffodil poking up out of the ground and trumpeting in your good news from it's a little yellow head for the crocuses and the tulips just thinking about coming up and all the other wonderful signs of new creation. The birds waking us up in the morning with their glorious music. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray in thanksgiving for um, the vaccine and for many people who are becoming more um, confident that they can join together with other fully vaccinated people. Some people can come inside here to worship. Um, we pray in Thanksgiving for the scientists who made that possible and for all the medical folk who are vaccinating people and taking all that time to do that. And we just pray that it would continue to make our lives and the lives of others more full and rich and come back together. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. At the same time, we pray for those who um, were not able to be vaccinated, both here and abroad, for the vaccine not coming to all communities the same way. And for those who, for whatever reasons, did not receive the vaccine and became ill. So we continue to pray for Fran and for Jesse and for Gloria and for Marty's neighbor, and for especially abroad, we get lift up the countries of India and Brazil who are seeing terrible spikes. And for across Europe where the new variant is making uh, its, its presence felt. Bring healing and strength and courage, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And we lift up all those um, folks across the world who are in various situations of distress, those who are experiencing flooding in Indonesia, 
uh, the families of those who died in a deadly train crash in uh, Taiwan and um, all those gathered around the cross of George Floyd on the ground there, uh, hearing more and more from witnesses uh, to his murder. We pray for justice and for peace. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for all those um, on our prayer list, for Ramona's family and friends, for David and Tom, for Carolyn and for Bruce, for Terry, for Mitchell, and Betty and Dr. John, Pam and Eddie, and prayers for Alexei Navalny in a Russian prison. Keep him safe and help him to be well. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We lift up these prayers now in this time of silence. Hear the prayers that are in our hearts that are difficult to say out loud. And now as forgiven and reconciled children of God, we pray, our creator, redeemer, sustainer, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Help us accept each other as Christ accepted us. Teach us a sister, brother, each person to embrace. Be present, Lord, among us, and bring us to believe. We are ourselves accepted and meant to love and live. Teach us. So Lord, your lessons, so oh, that we may be moved, we struggle to be human and search for hope and faith. Teach us to live for people, for all, not just for some, to love them as we find them. Just a few announcements before we receive the benediction and experience a wonderful postlude. 
Um, the endowment workshop that we're offering on Zoom is this Saturday at uh, 2 o'clock, the 17th. And um, we do have enough people to run it now, but we can still have more. It's just an opportunity to learn about um, our invested funds, which belong to the whole congregation and how the uh, best practices for managing them. If you would like to participate, you just contact our um, church secretary, Leslie Bauer, and she will send you the Zoom link. You can email her or you can call the church office. Uh, our Imagine No Racism class that um, Margaret and Parrish and I are planning to run again uh, was put off a week. It was supposed to start today, but we didn't have enough people. It was Sunday and Thursday, one class uh, for six Sundays, the other class for six Thursdays, uh, one o'clock on Sundays, two o'clock on Thursdays. Um, so we're, we're waiting to see. We're going to start it next Sunday if we do get what we need to, to run it. So it's just, uh, if it doesn't happen now, we'll do it later in the summer, but we'll see. And um, we'll just call your attention to all the other announcements in the bulletin. And um, I think you were able to look at that as it came in on the weekly update. And that will be wonderful. So go forth to serve God and your neighbor in all that you do, being kind and helping others. And may the peace of Christ, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God. And may the blessing of God, creating and redeeming and sustaining, be upon you and remain with you both now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>